How is it that we find ourselves surrounded by such complexity, such elegance? The genes of you and me, the genes of you and me, we're all made of DNA. We're all made of the same chemical DNA. you're watching DNA Today, a multi-award winning genetics podcast where we explore everything to do with genetics from CRISPR to rare diseases to new research. We have won the Science and Medicine Podcast Award for many years now. We have hundreds of episodes and we really hope you enjoy these conversations where we dive into so many genetic concepts. I'm Kira Deneen, a certified genetic counselor and your host. National Down Syndrome Awareness Day is just around the corner, March 21st. And for those that don't know, it's this date because it's the 21st day of the third month. So reference to three copies of Chromosome 21, which I think is very clever. Whoever came up with that or just the community in general. To learn more about the condition and community, we're joined by patient advocate, parent, and nurse, Janess Stock. She is an active parent in the Down Syndrome advocacy community, notably a member of the Down Syndrome Diagnosis Net network medical outreach team. Thank you so much for taking the time. You have a very busy life. So I appreciate you taking the time out of this busy life of yours to educate my audience and chat with me about Down syndrome. My pleasure. I am happy to do it. And I love talking about all the different ways that um, Down syndrome has enriched my family's life. Yeah. And, and we met a few months ago at uh, NSGC, so the National Society of Genetic Counselors Conference in Chicago. And just right away, you just had this beautiful energy to you. And it, you know, it's like you go from booth to booth and I try to hit everybody and you know, you're kind of getting tired. You're like, all right, you're trying to keep up the energy. And my goodness, I just felt energized after talking with you. So I would love to start out with how you first became involved in the Down syndrome advocacy community. Okay. So I have been around people with Down syndrome for most of my life. My uncle by marriage's brother has Down syndrome and he's nine years older than me. So I've known him most of my life. And uh, that same uncle married my mother's sister and they had a child who had Down syndrome and also a heart condition. So sadly she passed away back in the eighties before doctors were really adept at correcting these heart conditions. And then all through school from third grade on through high school, I went to kids school with kids who have Down syndrome. Um, I had, you know, kids at my elementary school. I had two girls in my homeroom who had Down syndrome. So I kind of just grew up with people who had Down syndrome around me. And I kind of always felt like I would be a good mom to a person with Down syndrome and thought that maybe someday I might adopt a child who had Down syndrome. And uh, when I was married to my first husband, we had three kids and it, it just never was the right time or anything to move forward with that desire to adopt someone with Down syndrome. And then I got remarried and uh, when I was about 13 weeks pregnant with our second child, I found out that he was going to have Down syndrome. And very shortly after that, I was contacted and connected by a couple different moms who have kids with BS. And they encouraged me to connect with different organizations like DSDN, which is the Down Syndrome Diagnosis Network, and Gigi's Playhouse, which is an international organization that provides um, services and educational opportunities for people with Down syndrome. It's a, considered a Down syndrome achievement center. And those were founded here in the Illinois area. And we have several that are within a reasonable driving distance from my home. So between Gigi's Playhouse and DSDN, I really learned how to become an advocate as a parent. And it's such a unique story that you have. I was just kind of taken aback by when we met because you had this mindset of, I think I'd be a really good parent to someone that has Down syndrome. And this, this idea of yours and kind of a yearning, it sounds like to say, at some point in my life, when it fits, I really want to adopt someone that has Down syndrome. And then for that not to happen, and you're pregnant and your biological child is diagnosed with Down syndrome. I mean, that's just 
the, the odds of that are just incredible. And, and I think, you know, I'm someone that kind of leads in fate in different things. And I'm like, yeah, that lines up of just, you know, and people that are religious, I don't know if that, you know, falls into your life, but it just kind of lining up in that way is just, it's, you know, some people would say coincidence, all that, but I think it's just so beautiful that you've always kind of had this thought and that you definitely grew up with surrounded by many more people with Down syndrome than the average person. I mean, you listed many people just now mm -hmm. within your family, within, you know, your, your school environment. Um, so I think that, you know, that had to play a role in just, you know, how comfortable you felt and just all the positive experiences that you have had, as you kind of mentioned, um, you know, I'd love to hear a little bit more. Your son is named Teddy, which is so cute. Um, I have not met him, but I hope someday I can meet Teddy. Um, but, you know, being a parent of Teddy, what are some of the more rewarding moments for you, either directly with Teddy or just how that has led to more experiences with the Down syndrome community? Because a lot of times in the medical field and in the genetics field, and I'm a genetic counselor, you know, we talk about, all right, well, we have to talk about all, you know, health concerns and, and things coming up in that sense. But I don't like to leave out the other part of the conversation. I think that's really important. Yeah. So, you know, it's really been a lot of fun watching Teddy develop and turn into his own little person with his sense of humor and his passions. And I think one of the most rewarding things, um, so I have five kids in total and out of the seven of us in our family, we all have different favorite bands or music styles, but the one we all agree on is Queen. We all okay. love Queen. That's the family favorite. Like if you're arguing, Queen's going on. Yes. And when Teddy was around four years old, he started singing the entire lyrics to Bohemian Rhapsody. Oh and that was a pretty proud moment that like- That's a long song. It's a very long song. And a lot of people with Down syndrome are not very verbal, especially at four years old. And you might not necessarily understand what he's saying, but he is saying those words to that song. So that is a pretty proud thing in our family. We went to two weddings this past summer and Teddy took the microphone from the DJ at both weddings and sang Bohemian Rhapsody. And it gets everyone to just stop and watch him. Oh my and, God. and how old is Teddy now? He's now eight. Eight. Okay. Um, what a cute does, age. He, he does still love Queen. He um, also very much loves ACDC and Beastie Boys. And I'm not sure where that comes from, but the it's kid's a lot got of good taste. I mean, better than most people, I'd say. <laughs> um, and, you know, he just has this personality and he picks things up and he's so smart. And um, so one day we got an email from his teacher that. Um, he was in class and he dropped something and he said, oh shit. And his paraprofessional looks at him and questions him and says, Teddy, what was that you said? And he said, oh shit. <laughs> and she redirected him and said, oh, when we drop something, we say, oh shoot, or oh darn, but we shouldn't say mm -hmm. that word at school. And meanwhile, my husband and I are thinking, well, he used it properly. <laughs> Right. Like, and you know, Teddy's the youngest of all the kids, right? Yeah. So when you grow up with older siblings, you're just going to be a little more mature. That that's what comes with the territory. So, 100%. so I mean, although, you know, the poor we, teacher, <laughs> we try to like rephrase what he's using as words, but we are also a little bit proud that yeah. you know, yeah. he used it properly. But what you just said brings me to the thing that I'm most proud of. And that is the bond and the love that all five kids have with each other and how much Teddy is an important part of our family. And um, when we first told them that Teddy was going to be born with Down syndrome, yes, I thought maybe I'd always be a parent to someone with Down syndrome, but I was still devastated when I got the news. Um, and, and looking back at it, I, I wonder why was I so devastated? And I have a little bit of guilt feeling as, as upset as I did, uh, when I first found out, but it wasn't what I was expecting. But when we told the kids that their brother was going to be born with down syndrome, their response was okay. Wow. So what's the big deal? Like they're waiting for like other news. They're like, Oh, you're, you mentioned that, but what, why are we sitting yeah. here? Why are you calling a family meeting? Yeah. And they call my, my uncle's brother, even though he's not really their uncle, they call him mm -hmm. uncle Patty. Mm -hmm. And they're like, okay, so he's going to be a lot of fun. Like uncle Patty is. And that was their takeaway. And just like the pride that I get from seeing my kids advocate 
for Teddy and, um, and be proud of him like that. That's pretty rewarding. That is so rewarding. That, that is just wonderful. And, and I, I think you highlight a good point of when we do receive news during a pregnancy that we're not expecting, and that is surprising, even for someone in your shoes that had thought I would like to adopt a child with Down syndrome, it still was a lot to process. And, you know, it sounds like there were some negative emotions at first with that. And I think we need to normalize that. And I just love how you phrase that of just, you know, you were like, wow, okay, you were thrown off and all that. Cause you were, you know, most of the time when we do this type of testing called non-invasive prenatal screening is maybe what you had with Teddy yeah. that, you know, we're expecting normal results because usually it does come back normal. Um, but sometimes we have a condition that comes back that there's an increased chance for. And, you know, we have a lot of healthcare providers that listen to the show. Um, one of my other hats is as a prenatal genetic counselor. So my, my job in our office is to call people and talk to them. And, and I'm the first person that's telling them that there's an increased chance that their pregnancy is affected by Down syndrome. What, what did that conversation look like? Because I assume you got the, the screening first and then a diagnosis later. Mm -hmm. What did that look like with the healthcare provider? How did they approach that conversation? So um, we'd had an ultrasound first and there were no soft markers for right. anything um, uh, to be abnormal, um, for lack of a better word. And so uh, we agreed to have the non-invasive prenatal screening and I had the blood drawn and then the next day piled the four kids who at this point were ranging between two and 15. Okay. Um, and um, we had piled in the car, drove a thousand miles to Quebec, where my mother and my grandmother were spending their summers. We have a family home there. And um, I was in Canada for a week and then drove home. And I was about six hours away from home and the phone rang. And thankfully, I didn't put it on speakerphone. I had an earbud in and it was the genetic counselor and she called and she said so we have the results from your genetic testing back uh, is now a good time and being a nurse and knowing that there were no soft markers i said sure and i'm driving and she says well there's about a 97 percent chance that your child is going to have down syndrome and i just okay because I you're like i gotta filter what I'm saying because all the kids are in the back of the car. Exactly. And I don't need my, you know, 13 and 15 year old children to be the first person to hear this. I need to talk to my husband first. Yes. I mean, yes. There's a million things going through my head and I still have six hours to drive. Oh. Um, so I process this for the next six hours without trying to lose it and got uh, dropped my three older kids at their dad's house and then drove home and saw my husband and just broke down and shared the news with him. And he was a rock and he was, you know, it's going to be okay. Everything's going to be fine. You know, we'll get through this. We'll figure it all out. And so then I um, had an appointment with my OBGYN a few days later. And this is a man who had delivered all three of my girls. Um, I'd known him for 13 years. Uh, I would say he had become a friend and when a healthcare provider talks to you that first time, they have to give you all the options. And he started it with, so I know what you're going to tell me to do with this first one, but I just got to say it. And you know, one of your options is termination. And if you're good, we're just going to move on. And like, that was what I needed at that time. Cause he knew this isn't something we even really need to talk about. Cause I know you're not going to do it. Right. He's just checking the legal box and making sure you're yeah. educated. You know, yeah. your options at yeah. that point. Yeah. Um, and of course he also shared, you know, the option of adoption, which for us wasn't an option either. And then he went on to talk about a CVS and an amniocentesis and doing nothing and figuring out what other things you need to do from that on. And, um, I really appreciated that for the remainder of my pregnancy. So at this point I'm like 14 weeks pregnant. The remainder of my pregnancy, those were never brought up again. 
the, my practitioners listened to what we wanted, that we didn't have any desire to terminate the pregnancy, and it was never brought up again. And unfortunately, I have a lot of friends who did have providers who every single visit, well, you still have this many weeks to decide. You still have this many weeks to decide. And didn't respect that the family had no desire to make that one of their choices. Mm -hmm. um, and so part of my desire with being this on the medical outreach team for DSDN is to help educate practitioners so that they don't continually ask parents the same question once they've already said, this is not what we're going to do. Um, and even as a genetic counselor, she had no idea that I was driving a thousand miles. Nope. And took my word for it when I said, is now a good time? So I don't know if there's a way that when you agree to get that blood test done, you make an appointment to discuss the results a week from now. And so you at least know, okay, I need to be in a place where I can talk about this and not have another six hours in the car. Yeah. Yeah. Some practices operate that way. And, and certainly when I was a student and rotating in cancer, or some of the neurological kind of, I, I did a neuro um, rotation. And like if when we did Huntington testing like that, they would have a set appointment. We knew we'd have the results back by then. So they'd know that day I'm getting the results. And, and I think that is helpful. I, I think with pregnancy, it's tough because everything is so, the timing is so important because yeah. you know, you're progressing and everything. And, and I, I think it, it is really nice to highlight that your genetic counselor you know, if, you know, and I'm sure you remember this verbatim because this was really important call in your life that said there's a 97% chance that mm -hmm. this pregnancy has Down syndrome or this baby has Down syndrome. Because I hear a lot of people say risk and I really hate the word risk. I don't know how you feel about that, but chance is a very neutral term to me. And that's, that's how I approach these conversations and say, you know, it came back a higher chance. And then, you know, I get into more of the information. I very much to. agree with you because risk makes it sound like it's something bad. Mm -hmm. And while Down syndrome is something we don't expect, um, I don't think of it as something bad. And, mm -hmm. and you know, someone, another parent with a child with Down syndrome may have a different perception, but for our family, it hasn't been something bad. And so to say that I have a risk, um, that would give it a different connotation. And so yeah. I did definitely appreciate the counselor saying there's an increased chance. Yes, I think that's really important for all healthcare providers listening that are in positions like this where they are delivering news and, and even saying we found some surprising news. You know, I think that sure. also is a neutral term yep. um, of just saying, you know, I'm kind of preparing you, you know, I'm gonna say something that you're not expecting. Mm -hmm. um, is there anything, you know, it sounds like your OB and the genetic counselor you worked with really really did a great job unfortunately sometimes i hear that that's not the case especially if it was you know teddy's you know younger fortunately you worked with this healthcare provider team that was awesome you you knew this ob for a long time it delivered your other kids and that's really really helpful not everybody has that situation where they know the provider or maybe the provider doesn't use these terms and approaches like we've been talking about you obviously know a lot of people in the Down syndrome community and you've heard a lot of stories from other people. From your own experience and hearing from others, is there advice that you have for healthcare providers like myself that are in these positions, you know, especially in the pregnancy area of just how to approach these conversations and just key considerations when we do start these conversations and, and to try to put ourselves in the position of the pregnant person and their partner? Yes. Yeah, so, and one of the things that we share um, on the medical outreach team when we attend different conferences, like the Genetic Counselor Conference that we met at, is the website for DSDN, which is dsdiagnosisnetwork.org. And on that website, there is a link for medical professionals. And this link has resources to discuss a Down syndrome diagnosis. Um, it also has pre-decision resources for parents. So when you have a likely diagnosis, parents can use these resources to help them sort through their decisions. Um, and on, under the resources for the medical providers, there's links on how to best deliver a prenatal diagnosis that comes from the American Journal of Medical Genetics. There's a list of uh, health supervision guidelines provided by the American Academy of Pediatrics. 
provided by the American Academy of Pediatrics so that clinicians can be prepared to respond to questions and help with the decision-making process. And then from DSDN, there's a guide to discussing the Down syndrome diagnosis following the guidelines that were outlined in the 2022 Health Supervision Guidelines. Uh, and links to all those can be found on the Down Syndrome Diagnosis Network website. Yeah, that's fantastic. I think it's great for people to have a go-to resource, especially one that was, I'm sure, designed by a team that included either people with Down syndrome or caregivers of people with Down syndrome to have the community have a voice in this. And I think that's just so important to include that in there. Um, and I also wanted to kind of, you know, highlight that you're also a nurse. So yeah. you yourself are a healthcare provider. Mm -hmm. How has your training as a nurse helped you in your patient advocacy skills and kind of just contributing to the community and, you know, educating other medical professionals? And how has this kind of elevated the way that you've been a, a patient advocate? So looking at it that way, I think just having the credentials behind my name that I'm a registered nurse, I have a master's degree in nursing education. Um, I have the background knowledge to support some of the some of the information that I will provide as a parent. But honestly, I feel like it's more of the flip side. Like I feel like I've become a better nurse because I'm a parent of a child with Down syndrome. And in my case specifically, I work for a large school district in Northeastern Illinois. And when I a, literally the day after I found out that Teddy was going to have Down syndrome, I had an interview with the school district. And the principal at the school shared with me towards the end of the interview that the school had three classrooms of kids with varying dis intellectual disabilities and the majority of them were kids with Down syndrome. And she didn't know I was pregnant. Um, I didn't disclose it at the first interview. And I almost lost it right then and there oh. because it was sort of like, this is where I need to be. It was like, like a this, sign. It was all yeah. coming together. Yeah. Wow. And, and wow. this is where, you know, me as a parent and me as a nurse is going to come together and I can help be an advocate for these kids. And um, one, of, one of my big platforms with with Teddy is inclusion and yes. making sure that he's in a classroom with other second graders, not just with other kids with disabilities. He thrives off of peer interactions. This kid gets invited to one or two birthday parties a month. And oh, scheduling just, wise, that's a nightmare. He's too popular. <laughs> Reel it back, Teddy. <laughs> he almost is. Like yesterday he came home with their class picture and he's like, oh, I want to have a play date with him. And I want to have a play date with him. And I want to have him sleep over. And I want to have him, you know. And, and as a parent, that's what you want. You want, you want your kid to feel included. And yeah. if he were tucked away in a class just for kids with special needs, he wouldn't get those engagements and those relationships with these kids. And um, in the district where I work, a lot of the time I don't see as much inclusion. And so as a parent and as a nurse, I really try and engage with the administration to help increase that and help see the value of that. Now, there is a very high link between children with Down syndrome and children with autism. Mm -hmm. um, we do not experience that with Teddy but I do see a lot of his peers have both and I have students who have both. And that makes it a little bit more tricky because once you add in that autism piece, a lot of the times there's sensory issues, being in a room full of 20 other kids, the noises can really be uh, distracting or a hindrance to the child. Um, so of course we have to look at every child and their needs specifically. I'm speaking from the heart from te for Teddy and he is a kid who thrives on being around his peers. Um, and knowing when that isn't always the most appropriate. I have a student here who, if he's in a room with more than eight kids, he just shuts down. So for him, that's not what's best. And so helping these parents advocate for what is best for their child, um, I feel like that's a really great way of me combining my nursing background and my my 
parenting as a child of a child with Down syndrome. Yeah, you you experience this at home and, you know, it's like moms are always on call, right? It's like sometimes you're on call as a nurse, but you're always on call as a mom and and bringing those skills in is just so wonderful. And I'm sure when you talk to parents of the students that you have, they feel that extra connection and that you understand their situation a little bit more than maybe some of your peers that don't have a child with an intellectual disability or down syndrome or on the spectrum or something, you know, in that nature. So I, I just imagine that parents are, are very grateful to have someone that has your background and empathy and all of these beautiful skills and, and traits that you have. You've highlighted, you know, some misconceptions and some challenges. Are there other ones that you wanted to mention just in terms of you know, healthcare providers listening, but also parents listening or parents to be of just learning a little bit more about, you know, what people with Down syndrome can experience. I mean, we haven't talked about too much of the health um, concerns that can come with it. So I don't know if that's kind of where you wanted to take it, but what comes to mind just hearing a little bit more about the challenges and, and misconceptions? For sure. Um, so I think one of the big misconceptions and, and also improper terminology is a lot of people will say, oh, he has high functioning Down syndrome or he's low functioning Down syndrome. And in the Down syndrome community, we really try not to use those words and those classifications. Um, yes, Teddy might be more verbal than his friend who is the same age um, and, and only has a few words or phrases that he says where Teddy can have a conversation with you. Um, intellectual levels may, may differ. Teddy has a bunch of sight words and can you know read at a kindergarten level where not every second grade student with Down syndrome can do that. But isn't that kind of how it is for everybody? Yep. Um, so not everyone has an IQ of 125 and, and that's okay. And, but we don't say that I'm a higher functioning person than Susie who works at a drugstore as a cashier. Um, so I think really taking those kinds of um, considerations and not using that type of terminology and classifying because we wouldn't do that for people without Down syndrome. Mm -hmm. um, another myth is that most children with Down syndrome are born to older parents. In actuality, there's more children with Down syndrome born to younger parents, but there's fewer older parents having kids. And yeah. so, so those statistics are a bit skewed. I have plenty of friends who are 15, 20 years younger than me and have kids with Down syndrome. So yeah. um, another one is that people with Down syndrome are always happy. Well, you didn't see Teddy getting on the bus yesterday. He wanted to bring two toys. To, he usually brings two toys on the bus, one for him and one for his buddy that he sits with every day Aww, on the bus. So considerate. Yesterday, he wanted to bring four. Mm. And he needed two for him and two for his friend. And I said, no, buddy, you're only allowed to bring two. And he would not get on the bus. And there's cars lined up in all directions because oh. they're stopped for the bus. And the bus driver had to put it in park and come down and grab him and pull him up. And she's she's a godsend. We, oh. we love our bus driver. Yeah. Um, but he is not always happy. And uh, Just like every other kid, right? I'm exactly. sure all of your kids have had very similar meltdowns multiple times. For sure. You for know? sure. Yeah. Um, I, I think another misconception is that adults with Down syndrome aren't able to build close relationships and they can't get married and they can't have a job and they can't go to college and they can't drive a car. But there's people with Down syndrome out there every day debunking those myths. And I, I don't know the exact number, but there's over 30 different colleges and universities in the U.S. that have programs specifically for people with Down syndrome to either get them a certificate or a degree. And if that's what Teddy wants to do when he's a senior in high school, we will apply to those schools for him to go. He yeah. sees his older brother and sisters going away to college. And I would bet that he's going to want to do that too. Um, yeah. So I think it's important to know that, um, you know, there are a lot of misconceptions out there. And those of us who have a loved one with Down syndrome, the more we can advocate for them, then we can just show that they just want to have friends and be liked and be challenged and learn and grow and work like anybody else. Yeah. And, and I think representation is so important too. Um, you know, I, I think about that in so many different areas of life of having representation of different types of people. 
And, you know, we had a uh, Lauren Potter on the show back on episode 176. So for those that don't know, she um, played Becky Jackson on Glee. Um, so she was on Glee for, for uh, all six Love seasons. Her. She is, she's a firecracker. <laughs> she, she is very similar to her character. She's not rude though. She's <laughs> just has the energy. She's very snarky. She's just, she's very just like sassy and like, I, she has a beautiful personality. It's, it's very fun. She's a fun one. Um, but I think it's just so important because sometimes I'll be sitting with people and I'll say, oh, are you familiar with Down Syndrome? Have you heard it? And, and oftentimes I'll be like, yeah, doesn't this actor have it? Or like, oh, that character on TV. And, you know, it's just so important. Like, you know, uh, Glee played what I was kind of high school, college age. So for me, that was a big show for, for people my age. Um, but you know, there's so many American horror story. I mean, th there's just so many, and it's just so mm -hmm. great that it's not just, oh, that one actor actress, yeah. there is now so many people. And I, and I think that just goes to show that, you know, people with down syndrome are really breaking a lot of records of being the first, this and first that, and it's, it's just so heartwarming to see, you know, and, and I just, I can't wait to have even more of that. Um, Spain and, you just know, elected someone to their parliament who has. Them. I saw that. I was trying to think. I was like, there's some recent story yeah. I'm not going to be able to pull. Um, thank you so much. Yes, yes. So it's just, it's so exciting when we see more and more of this. And, you know, I, I, I feel for, you know, people like Teddy that are young and, and to have role models are like, hey, they look like me, even when Barbie released the doll that has Down syndrome. I'm sure that mm -hmm. was a big, big topic in the yeah. community. Yeah. 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 For sure. Definitely. Well, thank you so much for just coming on the show and just sharing your family story and just sharing more about Teddy with us. I just, I love learning and hearing more about what he's like and everything. And maybe someday he can, uh, he can give me a performance of Bohemian Rhapsody. I would absolutely <laughs> love that. I will try to sing along, but he probably knows more lyrics than I do. Um, but thank you so much. I mean, th this is just wonderful. And, and I think you're just such a, a great role model yourself in terms of you know, people that are joining the Down syndrome community and just kind of being a light within that. So thank you for all the work that, you know, you do. You mentioned, you know, the Down syndrome diagnosis network and, you know, you're a, I believe you're part of the medical outreach team. Yeah. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. So you guys do awesome work and we'll, we have links in the show notes. You mentioned a bunch of different resources. Um, so just thank you so much. And, you know, I don't want to take more time away from your students. So. Thank you. I appreciate it. And, and in the notes there, um, I will send you the link also to, for practitioners to request materials. Um, Fantastic. They can we, use, yes. we, DSDN sends those out at no charge to offer new families and medical professionals uh, information about the different layers of support that we have. Oh, that is awesome. That is awesome. And we'll include links to like Gigi's Playhouse and, you know, other ones that you mentioned, because I know for people that are New York based, um, there's a pretty good presence uh, in, in New York and stuff. So, um, but yeah, this has just been, been wonderful. And um, yeah, happy National Down Syndrome Awareness Day coming up. So, um, you know, be thinking of you and your family and, and if I'm getting it right, we should rock our socks, right? I was just going to say, make sure you rock your socks and you, you can look that up online. Um, on why we rock our socks, but the basic premise is uh, chromosomes kind of look like a sock. Yes. And uh, with Down syndrome, you might be, you might look a little bit different, but on the inside, there's a lot of similarities. So even if your socks don't match, you can still have similarities. Yeah. So you want to wear two different socks from different pairs um, yeah. and usually high socks. At least that's what I've done. I don't know. Yeah. I'm you want to show those socks off. Yeah. So you got to show them off. Them up over your pants or yeah. if it's warm enough, wear shorts with your crazy socks. Yes. And, yeah. I love it. And if people can post on social media and, and tag us, that would be awesome. We'll definitely uh, reshare it and everything. Awesome. Um, but yeah. All right. So go rock your socks. Um, you know, go uh, support your students and everything, but thank you so much for coming on the show. All right. Thank you. Thanks for watching DNA Today. To access all of our episodes, head over to dnatoday.com. We also have a lot of bonus content on there that you can enjoy. If you have any questions, comments, suggestions, guest pitches, you name it, send them in to info at dnatoday.com. We'd also really appreciate if you could take a moment to rate and review the podcast on Apple, Spotify, wherever you listen to the show. It really helps more nerds like yourself find the show. Also, if you like giveaways and other ways to connect with us, I recommend following us on social. We're at DNA Today Podcast. We also have a Patreon if you want to be the most level involved in the show. That's also at DNA Today Podcast. Thank you so much for listening and watching. 
Join us next time to learn and discover new advances in the world of genetics. We're all made of DNA. We're all made of the same chemical DNA. We're all made of DNA.